Good morning. Welcome to the Board of Commissioners meeting for April 4th. And it still snowed this morning. Uh, I'm tired of the rain. Anyway, please join me in the pledge and in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And first on the agenda is item number two, public hearing on the sale of certain county forest land, county forester. Good morning. Good morning. Mike Warrington's County Forester. Pursuant to advertisements which appeared in the World newspaper dated March 28th and March 31st, 2023, a public hearing will be held April 4th, 2023, at 9.30 to hear public comments on the sale of certain county forest lands for ORS 275.330. This parcel of land is known as tax account 277200, containing approximately 161.19 acres, and is described in the tax order. The proceeds from the sale will be deposited with the Forest Parks Trust Fund. After the hearing, if the board finds it in the best interest of the county to sell this parcel of private sale, order number 23-02-017L has been prepared and is ready for signatures. Okay, discussion amongst the board? Any discussion? Mr. Taylor? No, sir. No, sir. sir. No, sir. Public comment on this item? Hearing none, um, I will entertain a motion. Move to approve and sign order 23020017L for the sale of lands as stated therein. No second? Second. All righty. Any other discussion? Nope. All righty. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lance. All righty. Moving on to 3A Present presentation of feasibility assessment of sea auto reintroduction to the Pacific Coast. Michelle Zawartis, is that correct? Zawartis, yes. Oh, okay, cool. Good Thank morning. You. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. My name is Michelle Zawartis. I'm the field supervisor at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Oregon Coast Field Office. And I talked to you about a year and a half ago, I think, to let you know that we were considering mm -hmm. the reintroduction of sea otters on the Pacific Coast and to let you know that we were doing a study on that. I'm here today to give you a very high level overview of the conclusions of our study and to talk about the next steps that we're planning and to uh, answer any questions that you might have at this time. Okay. So if you have the next slide, please. Another slide. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, so in uh, the Appropriations Act of 2021, Congress directed the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to study the feasibility and cost of reintroducing sea otters to the contiguous Pacific coast of the United States and report back within one year. Uh, we did do that after an inexplicably long review process in DC. Um, our report was finally released in July of 2022. Hopefully you received notification of that. It should have gone out to everyone. Um, and so that study is now available. And as a reminder, the Alaka Alliance, which is an independent nonprofit organization, also did a feasibility study specific to Oregon, looking at Seattle reintroduction. Go ahead. The approach we used for our report was the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Conservation Reintroduction Guidelines. They lay out a framework for assessing whether you want to reintroduce a species. And the overarching criteria that they lay out is, first of all, to ask whether the conservation uh, reintroduction will result in a net conservation benefit to the species and to the ecosystem. You can go ahead, Bobby. Thank you. And then secondly, to evaluate whether uh, reintroduction is a viable reintroduction option, to uh, evaluate both the feasibility and risks that would be associated with that reintroduction. 
looking at it from biological, legal, and socioeconomic perspectives. I want to emphasize this lays out all the different steps of a, a reintroduction. We are in the very early stages of considering reintroduction. First of all, uh, what we did is look at the conservation situation. Why would you want to reintroduce sea otters? Secondly, laying out the goals and objectives of a reintroduction, and then evaluating feasibility and risk, as I laid out. I want to emphasize, you can go ahead one more, um, that we are not yet at the point where we have decided to propose reintroduction. We're still above that red hash line in that diagram of just considering feasibility and risk. Go ahead, please. You can go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So here's the geographic scope of the area that we're considering. Um, that map might be kind of hard for you to see, but um, that is the Pacific Coast of the United States. It shows the areas where we have sea otters currently. So up in the northern part of the range off the coast of Washington, you have the northern sea otter. And then off the central coast of California, you have the southern sea otter. Oregon was historically a transition zone between the two subspecies. Um, but we no longer uh, have sea otters here uh, after they're eliminated from the maritime fur trade. Go ahead, please. So we limited the geographic scope of our study to Oregon and Northern California for several reasons. We decided that this was the area that would have the greatest conservation value for sea otters because it is the largest remaining gap in the historical range of the subspecies. It would reconnect the Northern and Southern subspecies, which would have, oops, um, <laughs> would have benefits for um, genetic flow and genetic diversity for those species. And um, also we decided it was impractical to consider reintroducing all the way down into Mexico. That just would not be feasible. Go ahead, please. And you can go to the next slide when you're ready. Thank you. So the goals and objectives of a reintroduction, and you can hit the next button, um, to restore the species and particularly to benefit the southern sea otter, whoops, which is a, a, a listed subspecies under the Endangered Species Act. So uh, restoring that connectivity and gene flow, as I mentioned, uh, which would benefit the species, which has lost a great deal of genetic diversity and could also expand the range and establish additional populations of the threatened southern sea otter to uh, potentially lead to the delisting of that subspecies. Uh, the second goal would be to restore ecosystem function. The uh, Appropriations Act of 2021 specifically spoke to the keystone role of sea otters and the benefits that they bring to the ecosystem through uh, controlling urchins in particular, and that leads to the uh, restoration of kelp forests as well as seagrass forests that all uh, promotes biodiversities in the near shore marine ecosystem. Kelp and seagrasses are very important in terms of uh, providing carbon sequestration services. They uh, sequester 20 times as much carbon as terrestrial plants do. Um, and then there's all kinds of uh, benefits to uh, fighting the effects of climate change, not only through sequestration, but through buffering shorelines from erosion and reducing ocean acidification on a local level. Go ahead, please. So from biological feasibility, we have determined that um, there are suitable habitats and prey that are available. Although once specific sites are identified, we would need to do further baseline assessments. Um, there's a whole host of ecosystem services benefits that would be realized as I discussed. And you can move ahead, please, on the slide. And finally, because of past reintroductions, we know that um, reintroduction is feasible. About a third of the sea otters in the world today are the uh, result of past reintroductions, although we know that there could be improvements in the way that those were done, and we um, got a lot of lessons learned from past reintroductions. Move ahead, please. In terms of legal feasibility, there's nothing that would preclude reintroduction from occurring. Um, there's a whole host of laws that would be associated with it, the main ones I'll talk about are the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there's uh, just a couple of constraints to be aware of with regards to these laws. For the MMPA, go ahead, please. 
One of the things to be aware of is that there's a take moratorium on marine mammals. So once sea otters are introduced, you cannot just capture them and move them around. You cannot cull them if you wanted to. That is not allowable. The other thing is that there is a subsistence hunting exemption under the MMPA, but that applies only to Alaska coastal natives. That exemption would not apply to any tribes in the lower 48 states. The other thing is that um, specific to California sea otters, there's no possibility of authorizing incidental take in the course of commercial fisheries. So that could be a concern for some fishermen, although in practice, this has not been a problem in California. Go ahead, please. For the ESA, I know a lot of people have um, apprehensions about ESA protections. We do have a provision under the ESA for reintroduction as an experimental population that allows us to remove those uh, restrictions. So you would be left with only the MMPA protections. So it is um, feasible from a legal perspective as well. Go ahead, please. From a socioeconomic perspective, the potential impacts to be considered um, this is where we had the greatest source of uncertainty, specifically because um, specific reintroduction sites have not been identified. But the potential impacts, go ahead please, uh, would be to shellfish fisheries. Sea otters do eat shellfish. So wherever sea otters and shellfish fisheries co-occur, there would be impacts to those fisheries. We do think that those would be relatively localized for a long period of time because we anticipate that any reintroduced populations will remain very small and localized for um, many decades. In terms of the potential benefits, go ahead, please. Um, there are much more diverse benefits ranging from the ecosystem services we've already discussed, benefits to finfish fisheries because those kelp and egress systems provide nursery habitats for important uh, finfish, there are significant monetary benefits that would flow from the ecotourism industry that would evolve around sea otters, as we've seen in California and British Columbia. And then there are significant uh, cultural values in terms of restoring sea otters for indigenous peoples and wildlife viewing um, values for people as well. So to circle back to our original question, is it a viable conservation option? We concluded yes, that um, it is feasible and we concluded there would be significant benefits to the species and the ecosystem. And then what we flagged for further study are the socioeconomic impacts in particular. Go ahead, please. The costs that we estimated were 26 to $43 million over a 13 year period uh, to reintroduce the otters. And then um, the uh, conclusion that has prompted the US Fish and Wildlife Service to continue considering reintroduction is that finding that um, there is a significant benefit to the species and ecosystem. Go ahead, please. So the next steps that we identified in the assessment um, were to initiate stakeholder engagement and outreach, and specifically we're looking for people to provide us with input on potential reintroduction sites to be considered and we want to know about um, any concerns, recommendations, values that people have about um, socioeconomic impacts that we should incorporate into our studies. Go ahead, please. Secondly, we recommend a couple of experimental pilot projects to look at the possibility of using surrogate reared southern sea otter pups as a source population, and also to consider releases into estuary environments rather than the um, open coast. And again, our objective would be just to establish some very small stepping stone populations to reestablish connectivity. Um, we're looking at a goal of one to 200 sea otters per population within 25 years. So we're not talking about thousands of sea otters. The next steps and possible timeline, um, go ahead please. Where we are right now is we are in the um, process of organizing a series of open houses to be held along the coast. These will be open to the public to solicit information to inform our next steps. Go ahead, please. Over the next year, we're anticipating more focused information gathering and input to complete these studies and develop alternatives to be considered. Go ahead, please. So in terms of the actual decision point as to whether to propose reintroduction, we're probably a couple years out at best. Um, what will happen next is if we decide not to, that'll be the end of the process. If we decide that yes, we will move forward, that would then kick us into a NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, environmental impact statement would be prepared. And from there, there would again be a major decision point 
where you would either choose the no action alternative or alternatively, you know, have, um, if one of the reintroduction alternatives were selected, uh, then at that point, assuming all other permits are in place, implementation could potentially begin. That's it. Very quick overview of a 200 page document. Um, can I answer any questions for you? Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you for that, uh, Michelle. I appreciate that. So, are you, um, how many, how many uh, individuals would you see introducing, say, say per area? I assume that Bandon would be an area that would be under consideration because it, it's a it's a real natural kind of a habitat for them. It seems like if you introduce too few indi individuals, I know there's uh, attrition over a very short time frame when you introduce like that. Maybe what half or something like that. It's actually been um, if you use translocated wild otters, the um, Initial losses are usually up to 90% of the individuals leave right away. So oh. you're exactly right. That's one of the reasons that we were looking at potentially using the surrogate reared pups instead, because they're not already imprinted on a home range elsewhere. Uh -huh. And they've had much better luck with them in California in uh, retaining those individuals uh -huh. once they're, they're reintroduced. Um, but the exact numbers haven't been determined yet, but some of the models that we've been running um, look at, for example, reintroducing 100 wild caught otters and then supplementing that with perhaps three pups per year over a period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that gets you to about 170 individuals retained 25 years out. Uh, and that 100 to, uh, building to 170 is over how, how big a range? Are we, are we talking about that would be like within a, within a couple mile area in band? Yeah, it, it's hard to say exactly. So that brings up another point that I didn't have time to talk about here is that something that's very important for people to be cognizant of is that we can do our very best to pick what we think is gonna be the very best habitat for right. sea otters and hope that they will stay there. Right. But we can't guarantee that they will stay there. You know, the sea otters are gonna determine what is best for them. Sure. So they could move elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so. It's hard to say, but generally they are social, they will stay close together, and they um, have high site fidelity. So once they establish in a place, they tend to stay there. That's one of the reasons that we're looking at reintroductions is that they don't tend to spread out all over the coast. They tend to stay in a very small home range area and not move very far. Okay. Michelle, do we have historical information that would tell us where the, the otters have colonized along the Oregon coast? What, what might be their favorite places? Well, we know that the best habitat, as far as we can determine, is here on the south coast. That's where you have um, historically the greatest number of kelp beds and rocky habitats uh, that they tend to like. Um, also up around Newport and Depot Bay was a good habitat and the mouth of the Columbia of Biostoria. Hmm. <clears throat> so, go ahead. Is there is there an aspect of the study that's uh, kind of extrapolated out what the what the current urchin populations might support? I mean, I, I guess that probably all aligns with the numbers that you've been talking about introducing. Is that right? Well, so so there's an interesting thing about the current urchin populations, and that is that um, most of those urchins, because there's so many of them, and because they've already eaten most of the kelp. Um, are in this kind of shriveled, atrophied state where they don't provide much nutrition. Oh. So the sea otters will probably not eat those urchins. They will eat urchins that have some heft to them and have some nutritional value for, um, for the otters. So um, they're not going to come in and, and clean up all those existing urchins that are already out there. So, so that's an important consideration. Um, but what we didn't do is do that type of direct um, prey assessment because we don't know exactly where we would be reintroducing sea otters yet. Um, it's just, it's unfortunate we were given such a short amount of time to do our study and we just weren't able to get into that level of detail. So that's what we're looking to do now. And so that would be, the next step would be to identify where do we think the best habitat would be uh, for the otters and then to assess what the prey base is there and see what the effects would be on that prey base. <clears throat> Under your MMPA, 
Marine Protection Act. Mm -hmm. So it says there's a take moratorium and no authorization for a single take, et cetera. So where are you going to get your wild sea otters? So we are so you are is fish and wildlife exempt? We can get a permit. We can apply for a permit to move sea otters. So there is a recovery permit that is available to mm -hmm. us. Yes. Okay. So you, you could capture and and move um, wild sea otters for the purpose of recovery. They will not permit you um, to go out and, and kill sea otters. Well, I understand that part, but I was just wondering where you were going to get them to fill in along the Oregon coast. Yeah. So we could we could eat we could get otters from the Central California population, or you could get otters from Washington or from Alaska, depending on which subspecies you want to take. And who gives out the permit? Pardon? Who who authorizes the permit? It's actually the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Oh, so you authorize There's two different. I know, I know. You do, you do. You end up permitting yourselves. Yeah, there's that's what I was wondering. There's something called the Division of Management Authority that oversees marine mammals, and mm -hmm. so you we would have to apply. The Ecological Services Program has to apply to the Division of Management Authority. To okay. The other thing too on the the next page here. The feasibility socioeconomic. You got down about the fourth one. It says regulatory requirements, especially the MMPA for marine construction projects. So, off the coast here, there's going to be proposed an 1,800 square mile uh, wind energy project. Does that affect sea otters? It would. There, that's going to be so far off the coast. It would not affect sea otters. 13 miles. Right, sea otters stay very close to the coast because they're limited by their diving depth. They can only mm -hmm. dive down to about 100 meters depth. So they're not found in the open ocean. They're found in the near shore marine environments. Mm -hmm. The only place that um, that project could potentially affect sea otters would be where the infrastructure comes in to shore, mm -hmm. if that were to affect sea otters somehow. But otherwise, in areas where you have um, like piers or dock maintenance or something like that, Okay. Um, if you have sea otters present, just like you do for seals or sea lions, mm -hmm. you have to get an incident harassment authorization. Mm -hmm. The same thing would be true for sea otters. All right, you. Anybody have any questions out there in the audience? I do. Uh, sir? What, what's the difference between Gary? and river otter, and are they going to be chipped so you can watch their movement? Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of differences between river otters and sea otters. Um, so, uh, but river otters can be found in the marine environment as well. Sometimes they'll come out into bays and along the shore. Um, but otherwise, sea otters are very much a marine species that live in the near shore marine environment and eat shellfish. They don't come onto land very often. They're very ungainly on land. Um, where, and they only have one pup per year, for example, which is a big difference between them and river otters. River otters are all over the river system throughout. The United States. Um, and to the second question, but they're going to be, be chipped. chipped. Yeah, so, and that's that's one of the things that we've not done in, in past transactions. They didn't have the technology at that time to be able to trace them. And we're actually finishing up research right now, working with NASA on a satellite path that will enable tracking of all the individuals. So, for the other people wanting to comment, would you please come up one at a time and address? Say your name and where you're generally from, and because we can't get you on the recorder if you're way back in the audience someplace. Vanessa, come on up. There's a live mic down the table here, too. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. How much do these little critters eat a day? How many pounds? How many Dungeness crabs could affect? I mean, how many do they eat a day? That's a very good question, and that's been one of the big concerns from the shellfish industry, is that because sea otters don't have blubber like seals or sea lions, um, they be, uh, rely entirely on their coat and on their high metabolic rate to um, keep them warm. So they eat the equivalent of 20 to 30 percent of their body weight per day. So depending on the size of the sea otter, um, that that would be uh let's see so so like for a female could be like 15 pounds of uh seafood a day could be more for the males so they weigh up to 100 pounds the northern ones do that that's really? up in alaska they can get up to 100 pounds 
Down here, they get up to about 70 pounds. Really? Yeah. So seven to 10 pounds a day, mm -hmm. 10, 15 percent. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So seven, seven to eight crabs a day. Something like that. Perhaps. But they, they don't eat only crabs. <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but they could, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, okay. and something to keep in mind um, and that we've talked with people about a lot is that there have been um, impacts on crab fisheries in areas where the crab fishery is very shallow, where the sea otters can reach. So one of the um, studies that's going on right now up in Alaska is looking at refugia for Dungeness crabs. So areas where the crabs occur in deeper waters um, it's believed that the you know sea otters could access crabs that were in the shallow waters where they can dive, but if the crabs are in deeper waters where the sea otters can't access them, that that would provide refugia for them. Um, there have been significant impacts to the crab fishery, like in the area around Destruction Island and Washington, has seen decreases, but overall across the state, there's been an increase in the crab fishery, and the same has been seen in California. So again, that goes back to what I was talking about in terms of we would anticipate localized impacts where you have the overlap, but overall on a larger scale, we would not. But that's a very early determination and that's where most studies can be. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Know. Taylor? <clears throat> Rob Taylor from Mandan, Oregon and um, Boy, I wish Don Chance was here right now. This, this would be great. Um, sea otters, cute little critters. They look delicious. Uh, I prefer to have the sea otters over actually having the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I want to remind this commission, it was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who, who through the abandoned marsh, reintroduced the mosquitoes in our area. I love it, the encephalitis and malaria. That's a beautiful thing to have and bring back. So you better watch out for the negative consequences. And like I said, I'd rather have the sea otters than the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This agency is known for bringing disasters, natural disasters that they cause to certain areas. We know this, we've experienced it, and this county, this county here stopped the largest wetland restoration project that would have destroyed the Coquille, city of Coquille and the city of Bandon by taking away five thousand acres of some of the most pristine farm and ranch property between here and Bandon. So please be very careful of these things. That's my common thing. Right. Thank, thank you, Rob. Anybody, Anybody else? else? Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And I just want to say that's exactly the kind of public dialogue that we want to have. This is why I'm here is to hear any concerns or comments that people may have. So I thank everyone for their comments and their input. And I hope that you will stay engaged as the um, discussion continues. And um, please stay in touch and let us know what All you right. think. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, 3B, request approval of contract with Orion Center for Nursing Authorized Mike Rowley to doctor sign for Coos Health and Wellness. Michael. Yeah, good morning, Mike Rowley, Director of Coos Health and Wellness. Uh, this morning, is Mike. an award that we got from the Oregon Center of Nursing for $50,000 to get uh, some tablets for our home, nur home visiting nurses, as well as the ones in Crook and Jefferson <laughs> County. Uh, we're kind of all three going in on it together. Okay, a motion? I move we approve the contract with Oregon Center for Nursing and authorize the department head of through self and wellness, Mike Rowley to DocuSign. Second. Second. Discussion? Is there any any requirements attendant with this, Mike, or is it just a... Uh, well, a uh, we are going to review tablets, purchase tablets. Uh, it's mainly for forms, so we're going to review forms and convert them so they'll be tablet ready. And then the home vi visiting people will kind of train all together on use of this out in the field. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody on it want to come in? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All, right. all right, 3C, request approval of amendment number two to network provider agreement with Southwest Orient IDA, authorized Mike Crowley to sign. Yeah, this is our, uh, <coughs> major contract with our uh, 
community care organization, Advanced Health or SWIPA, it goes through SWIPA. Uh, it is for $10.8 million, which includes uh, $1.3 million in fixed payments, $5.7 million in capitated payments, and an estimated $3.8 million in fee for service. Uh, this will support wages for staff, uh, retention, recruitment, new staff, and contracts. Uh, it is an estimate based on uh, OHP membership, and currently there is about 24,000 uh, OHP members in Coos County, which is about 37% of our entire population that we serve. Okay, we have a motion. Uh, motion to approve Second Amendment Network Provider Agreement with SWIPA and authorize Department Head Mike Rowley to sign. No second. Second. Discussion? What is the, uh, what's the reason for the expected decline in OHP enrollment? So uh, it all began with the pandemic. And so when the pandemic started, they didn't want to kick people off of OHP. So they had a special rule that allowed people to stay on during the emergency. Well, the emergency is ending. And so now they're going to review all of those people and then they will start disenrolling them. Uh, it's estimated about one in six will lose OHP at, with this disenrollment. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions, Joe? No. Any questions for the audience? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Dean. 3D, request approval transfer of expenditure appropriations, Michael. Uh, yeah, so we recently were approved for three new mobile positions, and so now we're moving funds to purchase additional vehicles for those staff. Okay, is there a motion? I move that we approve and sign resolution 23-03-064B. Okay, second. Second. Discussion? Board? You're wondering? No. no. Okay. Any discussion from the audience? Okay. Here you see none. All figures? Aye. Aye. All right, sir. And uh, I'd like to request a late, late agenda, if I may. Okay. Uh, well, it's well, actually the purchase of the two vehicles. Oh, oh okay. That's it. Okay. Got it. I got to find it. Right. Oh, here it is. Move to accept the late, late agenda item. Items. Is it items? Yeah, we got to. Under our rules, we have to move first to approve I thought we had having to late, late agenda items, and then we got to go approve the late agenda. I thought we needed to approve the uh, consideration of each one individually. No, well, we have to uh, allow, um, consider having any late, late agenda items first, and then we consider each late, late agenda. My item. motion stands. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I second just for motion. clarity. What do you got, Michael? Uh, request to purchase two new vehicles for the MRT team. All right, uh, not to exceed eighty-five thousand dollars total. Wow. Price of cars are going up. Uh, anyway, do I have a motion before we discuss? I move approval of uh, giving approval to purchase new two new vehicles in an amount not to exceed eighty-five thousand. Second. Second. Discussion from the board? No? Discussion? No? Uh, these are obviously brand new vehicles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You guys ever, ever consider uh, looking at good used vehicles? That yeah, the last two we actually bought were used. Uh, and, you know, honestly, we couldn't find new ones the last time we bought vehicles. How are those working out? Uh, they're working out fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, see you thinking. I thought maybe another question. Well, I mean, I, you know, Choose Health and Wellness has the, has the budget to, to support this, uh, you know, without without a second thought, really. Mm -hmm. I wish that, that were the case for the rest of the, oh, yeah, for the general fund departments and so forth. But, well, that's what I was thinking back when you were talking about $10 million coming in and going, mm -hmm. can you get one for the general fund? Too? Yeah, how about that? 
<laughs> All right, any other questions? Any other questions from the audience? Okay, there you go. Oh, yes, Mr. Taylor. Mike, I'm not sure if I heard you heard. What are these vehicles going to be used for? Uh, mobile response team. What is the mobile response team? Uh, that is our mental health crisis response team. So 24 seven, they go out across the county to uh, any calls. They assist the police in uh, any of their dealings with mental health. Like anyone who's homeless, anyone on the street would also call for that? Potentially, yeah, we do deal with the mobile team deals a lot with the homeless. Mm -hmm. I understand the, the sheriff really likes this program. It helps his officers deal with it, some of these folks. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on to 3E, address approval of repairs for Oaks Pavilion. Gary? Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Gary Hagel with the uh, Fair Board. A little bit of an update on the Oaks building. Um, we had terra firma down and they took measurements and the building has sank seven inches so far. There are three springs currently coming up underneath it. We have uh, two bids on putting new post and blocks in to uh, raise the one portion of the building that sank the most but that can't be done until we solve the other problem of the water coming into the building uh, there is a french drain all the way around it but currently it's only a foot to 18 inches deep <clears throat> we've had a couple of people come out and look at it and they are suggesting that we put in a new french drain around the the back side where the high school is and around the east side where most of the water is coming from. Uh, they believe that that French drain should be at least five feet deep. And uh, so currently I'm getting bids on that. I just gave you uh, a sheet stating the one bid that I've received already. I have another uh, gentleman or another business looking at it on Monday. Uh, also, crawling around underneath there, uh, Jason Wilson and I found a leak in the propane lines underneath the building. And so we contacted Ferro Gas on that. They told us to turn the gas off. Yesterday they sent a man out and he fixed the leak. And he found another problem that needs to be uh, worked on is that the pressure from the propane tank into the building is too high and that uh, since since we took out the gas stoves and a couple of the other things that were run by gas we have too much pressure going into that building to run the uh, hot water heaters so he's figuring out a bid on replacing two of the pressure switches for uh, for that system um, so uh, I think there was a request for $20,000 to uh, put post and blocks under the building but I think that we're going to have to revert that to uh, the new French drain around the back and sides because that problem needs to be solved first before the second problem can be fixed. Are there any questions? So you want to table this request? Well, we're going to need some money to pay for, for the French drain, and that has to be fixed first. So I don't know if we can just uh, change this proposal for the post and blocks to French drain. We authorize, as I recall, 20000 not to. Uh, for the post and blocks. For uh -huh. post and blocks, and I, I would. Uh, well, first, I need to, we need to pause a little bit here because we're, I think we're getting up to the point where this will become an insurance claim. We have a what, $25,000 deductible? Correct. Mm -hmm. So um, the insurance adjuster is coming tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. So I think we probably ought to get their permission first okay. to do anything. 
but I, I would, that's uh, fine. It's gonna I, it's gonna take me a while to get a while. some more. Uh, Want to get a few more bids? One at least one more for the post and block underneath, and hopefully a couple of more for the French drain. Okay. But I, I would move so that we have the money available. I think getting the water problem taken care of is the first step. Right. So I, I would move that we uh, allow <laughs> the, uh, the twenty thousand dollars previously authorized for uh, the correcting the, the foundation under the building to be uh, changed to provide for controlling the water problem. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Sweet, I'm, uh, I would I would actually ask you to consider altering your motion again to bump up the not to exceed to 25,000. Why not just go ahead and hit our deductible to begin with, uh, anticipating <laughs> the high likelihood that we will be covered under insurance on this repair? I like to have the, the treasurer here, the finance director here, but we do that. She's here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Hiding back there. And I love that. That's a good idea if, if we can do that. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. So, as I understand it, usually when we go through insurance claims, the insurance actually pays it directly and then we pay the deductible portion. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah, typically. So, if we're going to go through insurance, let's just authorize the 25000 for the deductible and be done with it. Okay, that's why we call on the treasurer. It might not. So, so I will draw my motion and uh, <laughs> revise it to uh, authorize payment of the 25000 uh, deductible on the insurance for repairs to the oak building at the fairgrounds. Okay, so second. Okay, discussion about this? Where's the money coming from? From you. That's your question. <laughs> That's your, where do we took it, take the 20 from? We had, do we have that much in the fairground maintenance, I believe? Well, we have a, uh, we can come from the, uh, our insurance. So, they do that a lot. In the general okay. fund? Oh, yeah. The insurance is at the line of I think we don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, so there was multiple discussion. I don't I can't remember if a decision was I actually ever made. Um, economic development or um, ARP funds or the fair finding the money in their budget. Well, My first preference I don't think is fair to the money. But I, I don't I don't think they have it. So. And then economic development after that. So If we can find the money at the fair, use that. If not, use economic development. I'll add that to the motion. Do I have a second on that? Yes. Second. Amendment to the. Okay. So that is it, I guess. Okay. All right. I'd like to pause for a little bit. Hang on a minute. No, we got a little Any other discussion about this? Okay, John. Uh, I just want to thank <laughs> Gary and all the others that have been down there working. I don't know that when you signed on to the fair board that you thought it would be a full-time position. Um, yeah. uh, I didn't you're, you're really hands-on, you're just on, <laughs> above and beyond. And the, the good thing that's happened, I think, we might not have located those gas leaks where we're not in there messing around with this water issue. So there's a bit of a silver <laughs> lining to this. They could have avoided, maybe avoided a, a huge, huge problem. I wanted to embarrass Gary a little more in that I was out there with him last Friday looking at this issue and uh, we were inside the building and you could visibly see that the south is dropping, especially the southeast corner. And uh, there's a crack, crack developed in the oak flooring, hardwood flooring about a oh, sixteenth of an inch wide running the full length of the building. So it's kind of going this way too. And then uh, we went around the backside and Gary and two other folks had excavated with a shovel around about 80% of the building on the, on the uphill side where the water's coming in. And uh, they also were crawling under there 
examining the underside. The piers are sinking in the center portion of the building, but apparently the outside sinking maybe even faster. But we couldn't find any cracks in the perimeter foundation wall. And then he invited me to go crawl under the building looking for the gas leak. And I said, yeah, maybe I'll come back later with some <laughs> other clothes on. <laughs> and I left him at that point. And then we discovered that I called the insurance and they, they wanted to come out and do a, a look-see, so. Uh, one other thing, uh, the French drain that's there now, uh, I don't know if it was put in correctly at the time, but as with looking at the new French drains and stuff, it, it pretty much shows that that uh, was done wrong. So well, whether it was right at the time when it was put in, maybe, but uh, it's definitely not put in right now. Yeah, when Gary Drug excavated down with the shovel far enough to find the, the drain, and it's only about that far up below the, the uh, surface level of the soil. So it really doesn't do anything. Yeah, and then part of the gutters and downspouts were going into that area too. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, uh, when Commissioner Sweet and I went out and investigated it with, with Gary, we did crawl under the building. Ooh. <laughs> Being much younger than Bob. Yeah. <laughs> or nimble or something. But it does, yeah. it does seem like uh, the result is, is maybe resulted from the uh, construction on the football field up the hill. And I agree with you, Gary, that that and Commissioner Main, that that, that drain needs to be, I think, farther from the building and, and yeah, down to mm -hmm. five feet. And then, of course, the rain gutters need to go into a solid pipe. Uh, that's, that's been cut. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. But before, can you imagine this? The rain gutter, the downspouts, were going into a perforated pipe. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> no, but apparently, whoever did that didn't know what the heck they were doing. Yeah. We've right. had a propensity to try to save lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's you. Up with us. Thank All you. Right. All right. Did we vote? Yeah. All in favor? No. Aye. 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 All right. <clears throat> All right. 3F <laughs> requesting <laughs> approval to purchase golf carts. It says cars, but yeah, that, that's sorry, that's a misprint. Good morning, Craig Storm, morning, Parks Craig. Director. Yes, um, we had in our budget to purchase uh, a new uh, pickup uh, around the cost of uh, like sixty-five thousand dollars for for you know for a new vehicle nowadays. Uh, so we decided that that wasn't feasible uh, just to get one vehicle when um, I can only you know spend. Uh, $22,000 and get three uh, carts that we could use in three different locations instead of having one vehicle in one location. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I contacted uh, Forsum Golf um, in Woodburn and um, they have uh, two used uh, 2018 uh, precedent golf carts and they call them cars, but um, they call them a cart. And they're, they're going to modify them for us. They're going to put um, a, a bed on the back of it, a, a three by four bed. They're going to take off the rack that holds the golf clubs and all that. They're going to put a, a, a so that we can haul our uh, supplies around with it, you know, cleaning supplies, backpack blowers, everything we need to do maintenance in the parks. Um, plus the uh, host, our volunteers can use these and won't have to worry about the DMV and the and the vehicles or the UTV and all of the licensing and training and all that sort of things that they have to do. So what I'm uh, pro proposing is uh, to get one carry-all, uh, which is a brand new one. Uh, and we have one of these at um, Laverne now, I bought uh, three years ago. Uh, the fairgrounds has actually borrowed it a couple of times and used it um, during fair. It's a, we haven't had a bit of problem with this carry-all um, since we got it. And um, it's a brand new one, uh, 2023. <clears throat> the other two, which are the golf carts, are 2018s. And like I said, they will be used at uh, three different locations, <clears throat> Powers, uh, Bassendorf, and Riley. And uh, for the amount of $21,999 that we do have, this, like I stated earlier in our funds. 
Mm -hmm. this year. Yeah, motion. I move we approve the purchase of two used and one new golf car or cart from Porson Golf Cars for the total amount of $21,999. Okay, no second. Uh, second. Okay, discussion with the board. Craig, thank you for taking your seat. Just it sounds like a much, much better, better answer. answer. Okay, mm -hmm. anybody in the audience? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. All right, uh, 3H, request approval of IGA for Transportation Growth Management Program grant and authorized chair to sign for community development. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. Oh, G, request approval resolution making additional appropriations. Yeah, for CVA, Crime Victims Associate. See, they weren't here, so that's why I skipped them. <laughs> All right. Jill, you're going to take over? Do you want to go to the next one or do you want to do something? No, the current one, G. No, I don't want to leave it back. Do you have huh? anybody on it? I thought you were doing this nope. one. That's why you jumped up there. No, nope. I we're skipping. I'll do, make it do we, I don't think it's any big deal, so you want to take a jump? Sure. Uh, the background is that uh, crime victims uh, received additional state Funds. These funds were originally not allocated for this current grant cycle. They were later released through state replacement general funds legislation. Uh, we need to uh, sign and approve a resolution uh, authorizing this appropriation transfer. So I move that we approve and sign resolution 2303065B. You have a second? A second. Discussion? Good. No. Audience? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The ranking. Now, Jill. 3H, request approval of IGA Transportation Growth Management. Um, Jill Rolf, Community Development. So, this is an intergovernmental agreement between um, um, DLCD, ODOT, Confederated Tribe, and Community Development. And what this is is Coos Head. Um, property was sold to or transferred to Confederated Tribe. It has a forest designation on it currently, which means that they really can't do a lot with it. So they've applied for grant assistance to rewrite a code that will apply to that property and go through a process so that they can develop the property. Okay. Motion. I move we approve entering into the intergovernment mental agreement under PGM grant to allow coexistence to create the CHAMP zone and address any comprehensive policies required and authorize the chair to sign. Second. Okay. Discussion with the board. So. So we're just uh, loosening up the uh, planning zone for utilization of that particular property. That's a great summarization, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, they have to do a master plan for this property and they have the actual master plan done, but the zoning won't accommodate it. So now they're writing the rewriting the zoning, and then eventually it will come back to the board to adopt into the comprehensive plan. So this is uh, this is going to be a development plan consisting of an interpretive center, a conference center, and hotel, tribal center, recreational vehicle, and tent camping. So I, I guess. One question that I have is, are we are we going to? I guess we can now look at uh, rezoning other forest lands for commercial use as well. You can do that at any time you would like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is just the tribe seeking funding so that they have the expertise to actually write their application. Mm -hmm. Because the county can't write their application for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're partnering to get that funding so they can write the application. Okay. And knowing this property as I do, it, the slope of it and the exposure to the 
winter storms that's on the kind of the southwest side of the mountain, it really doesn't grow trees as well at all. It's mostly, it grows really good salal yeah. and other brush. So when uh, the comprehensive plan was adopted, if it was in a federal ownership and this was in the naval base, um, it automatically was zoned forest. We didn't look at any any alternative plans. So it was mis-zoned to begin with. It has water, it has sewer, it had intensive development on it at one time, a road structure, everything was there. So it should have never been designated a forest land. Okay. Anything else in the works? For me. Anybody from the audience? Mr. Taylor. Uh, perchance, is this part of the Halloween place? Is this for, no. no. Where is this hotel located? You know where the observation for the Coast Guard is overlooking the, 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 the jetties? Right. Well, it's back back inland a ways and right above Bassendorf Beach parking lot. Is this, this grant, it's a grant, right? Is this coming from the county or is this coming from other funding? Comes from state. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. See, oh, Danessa? We're always interested to hear what you have to say. Does this have any adverse effect for taxation or will it gain tax, a tax base? It is not tax exempt. The only way it would become tax exempt is if they were to take it to trust land or they came into trust land, they wouldn't have to apply it to land. No. Good question. Yeah. They would go into trust lands by the BIA. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't ask the county. Right. They already own it anyway. Okay. Any other discussion from the audience? Okay. All in favor from the board? Aye. 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 All right. Good. Thank you. Um, request to order adopting the road name Storage Drive. Like, shouldn't Darius be presenting on this? Storage, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what kind of storage? <laughs> yeah, or mini um, storage. So this is in the matter of uh, the adoption of an official name of a road, Storage Drive, located off of Hauser Road, north of the city of North Bend. Order number 23-02-015PL. Um, basically, when you have a third access point off of a road, you're required to name a road. So this is pretty routine. It's already went through all the notice process and everything. We're just waiting for adoption from you. Hmm. Okay. So, motion, please. I move to approval. Go ahead. Uh, move to adopt the official name of a road storage drive located off of Hauser Road, north of the city of North Bend, order number 230015PL. Second. Okay. <laughs> Discussion. This thing's only 100 and roughly 70 feet long. That's why it's a drive. Yeah. But it has more than one parcel serving, yes. so it has to have a road name. Correct. It's for right. emergency purposes. Mm -hmm. Discussion? No. 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 Audience? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, team. Thank you. Okay, Joe. request approval of grant agreement with Ford Family Foundation and authorize John Sweet to sign approval making additional appropriations for County Council. So the Ford Family Foundation has approved $50,000 to support new bleachers at the rodeo arena at the Coos County Fairgrounds. A final report on the use of grant funds is due October 31st, 2023. So we're just asking the board to sign the grant agreement to approve the resolution. Okay, motion please. I uh, move to approve grant funding agreement with Ford Family Foundation for funding the new rodeo arena at the Coos County Fairgrounds and approve and sign resolution 23-03066B. Second. Okay. Discussion with the board? It's a very mm -hmm. generous contribution mm -hmm. from the Ford Family Foundation mm -hmm. that will enhance the, the uh, usability of the rodeo grounds it's okay. awesome i think this was uh, part of a 
project that Gary's again involved with mm. to uh, replace the old bleachers at the rodeo arena at the fairgrounds with new bleachers, which will be located right in front of the grandstand. It's about a hundred and thirty-five thousand dollar project. Uh, it's been done uh, primarily with grant money. I believe there's some uh, county money, ARP money involved. Mm -hmm. And to comment that uh, given the revisions in the layout at the rodeo arena, uh, if it ever quits being a swimming pool, uh, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of interest in that. And, and one of the interested parties is uh, the Youth Rodeo Association of Oregon. And I don't know yet, Gary, they haven't concluded to do it. Come up and I want to hear about that. Yeah, the Youth Rodeo Association was excited about uh, our offer to let them use it for free. However, Columbia County came in and offered theirs for free and gave them money also to cover their stock contractor, which we couldn't afford. And so we got denied this year because <laughs> they took the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was there when they came down and they were very, very interested and I'm convinced that they'll be there sometime or another. And when they come, it's 200 families with their campers and their kids uh, for a long weekend at Myrtle Point. So it's a good thing. Yeah, so we did lose them for this year anyway, but uh, we are still uh, a go for Janu or July 2nd for the Mexican bull riding. Good, nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ole. <laughs> Anything else from the board? From the audience? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 3K, rest approval of joint funding agreement for river gauges. This is an annual request through USGS to fund the river gauges. That This one particularly is um, on the south fork of the Coquille River. We have one at Powers, one at Little Point, and one at Coquille. Basically, it alerts. Um, dispatch to alert all the ranchers and farmers and homeowners along the riverway if we're going to have a flood. Now I know sometimes Commissioner Sweet refers to it as Bob Main's ideal fishing time to go steelhead fishing, but I didn't even go this year because there weren't any steelhead. Actually it's when not to go. Yeah. So that too. to sleep in yeah. without having to go to the towers. Yeah, yeah. It's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It's very important. But anyway, it's very important to dispatch and to all the ranchers along the Coquille Valley. Mm -hmm. So I have a motion. I move we approve the joint funding agreement with DOI USGS in the amount of $13,585. Have a second? I have the second. Okay. Discussion with the board? Uh, mm -hmm. Should we add a U in that, in that word, gauges? Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, know. Yeah. I was doing it wrong for you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. yeah. Anything else from the board? Okay. From, the, from the public and Vanessa? You might want to sit up front closer. <laughs> <laughs> So where where are these points going to be at exactly on the on the, the Coquille River Forest? Well, I think they're on the bridges. They're going to be on every bridge. They've they're been there for years and years and years and years. So they're just redoing them, or we're, it's a we have to redo the contract every year to have those. Okay. USGS and maintains is this posted, them. Posted where is it posted? These these levels. Oh, you can get it on the USGS website. There's also I've got. Several other sites you get to hold of me later on. Okay. Okay, and, yeah. and, and it keeps it historical and all that kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. okay. You can go back as many days as you want on the on it. Uh, let me see here. Let me find it a moment. But I have it in my phone here someplace, and all you do is click on it, and it gives you all the gauges throughout western oregon and then you got to scroll down and find powers 
the murder point or coquille and then click on let's say the gauge height it'll tell you whether it's going up or down and historic uh, levels so there's only three points on the river right has, has there been expressed to have more uh no and there's none on the north fork or the middle fork or the east fork uh this does say north fork though i know but that's not quite right <laughs> So oh, here it is. Years. Here it is. It's called Oregon Levels with Pat Welch, W-E-L-C-H. And it lifts, it starts off with, oh, we're at Tidewaters, Applegate, Applegate, Brighton Bush, Bull Run, Clackamas River, Columbia's, Coquille, Cow Creek, Crooked River. Oh, even into mid um, central Oregon. Anyway, I just downloaded it as an app on my phone. All right, anybody else from the audience about this? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And 3L, request approval of letter of support for Port Coos Bay Pacific Coast Intermodal Port Project. What's this, John? Yes. Um, the, the Port of Coos Bay has uh, requested that the Board of Commissioners uh, sign, write and sign a letter of support to the U.S. Department of Transportation for their uh, container project on the North Spit. So uh, I would move that we approve and, and uh, sign such a letter. And it's all written here for us. Okay, do I have a second? Second. All right, discussion with the board. I wonder if there's any avenue that we could take to uh, to accommodate a, a greater percentage of the, to reduce the special taxing district uh, uh, monetary take out of these uh, tax revenues from the port to support county operations that are going to be Germain to the operation and safety of the port. Well, we could certainly look at it at a later date. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion about this letter? No? Not mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, uh, Anybody now? Jill? I'm just going to remind you that there will be a land use application. So even though you're supporting the project, as far as supporting it, <laughs> yeah. we had this come up before in Jordan Cove, and I just want to make sure that, you know, when you disclose anything that you disclose that you did support the letter, but that was in your role as Board of Commissioners, not as a land use decision. Right. Order. This isn't addressing criteria yes. for approval of land use decision. And we, and we did have this issue arise, as you mentioned, with the Jordan Cove project where there was a letter of support that was litigated. We went to the Court of Appeals and we 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 won on that issue. Right. It was it was it was deemed that you know a politician can generally support the concept of a project so long as they're not making some sort of commitment to approve it without looking at uh, the criteria. So what what happens is if, if a decision were to come before the board, then the board would say, while we have signed letters along this line, if the board approves it. You know, we're going to look at the criteria in this case and make an objective decision based on this criteria. It's just to protect you in case of an appeal later. Okay. okay. Thank I you, think Jill. Mr. Taylor had his hand up. I want to go back to the special taxing district. Is this an enterprise zone for a chance? It's in a UR. It's in the UR. All right, is UR money going to be used for any of this project? Because it was deemed to be used for the LNG. Don't know. Okay. It hasn't been asked. It hasn't been asked of. Okay, because I know, Bob, you and I used to agree on this. I don't know still where you're at on this. I would like to get rid of those URAs, including the county URA, and get that tax flowing back to the county and all the other special districts. We have, we, whose county has seven you are in the county. There's the North Spit, North Bend, two in Coos Bay, one in Coquille, and two in Bander. Which puts us at the highest of the percentage. The second highest in all counties in Oregon for URs. 
they extract and if you weren't here at the budget meeting yesterday where we're going to be extremely difficult for the 25 26 budget to make ends meet and who knows what's going to happen but there's no funding yet available but those seven URAs, well, they may do good work, quote unquote. They extract about $450,000 out of the general fund budget, of which we only get $6 million in property tax now, right. roughly, and the jail is $7 million just by itself without all the other general fund departments. I never Why heard that before. before. No, I see it every board meeting. Almost, yeah, almost, and I think we need to get rid of it. Maybe these. it'll I think it's resonate time that pretty soon. Looking at that because <laughs> they're all they're doing is giving money to very wealthy developers. You know, I, I'm sure the uh, Drobots appreciate the hundred or so thousand dollars they got for development, but I think they can afford it. They took all that money right. for their dad from that workforce uh, uh, scandal back in California. Uh, I think that there's, you know. It's, it's a waste in many ways. And I think instead of giving money for facades for businesses, I think it would be better to have that money to go back to the county so you can pay for the things you actually need. These are necessities and we're paying for luxuries. And the urban renewal, and you know, you can go back to the 50s when the federal government had urban renewal. Talk about a racist industry. I mean, you know, they used to call it Negro Removal Project because there was neighborhoods that were predominantly black and, and, and other minorities who are getting shredded apart by federal urban renewal money. This, you know, and it's the only agency that has imminent domain powers or one of the few agencies that has imminent domain powers. It's bad. And I seriously think we need to start looking at that. You know, one way you could get rid of it without making it as obsolete is make the cities vote to, to and we tried to do this to make the cities vote on any changes that they do with those urban renewals, either increasing the debt, whether expanding the, the, the zones. And, you know, and I want to go back to the enterprise zones. They keep talking about way, how we have a lack of housing. Why don't we give enterprise zone exemptions to people who are building houses, apartments, mobile home parks? Why don't we do that instead of giving it to multi-billionaire businesses? I don't understand the way we think in this, this, this country. And it's not your fault because you didn't create the system. It was created by the state. And so that's just been one of my bugaboos for a while, you know me. And one of the things you don't know is last week, early last week, mm -hmm. I received an email from AOC, Association of Oregon Counties, mm -hmm. stating that one of their staffers was going and the AOC was in favor of supporting an extension of the URAs for another 10 years. And I went, what? So I started emailing email back and forth. I got the director right. and I got all kinds of people and said, what are you doing? We, the county, support AOC and you're trying to take funds away from the counties? Literally. I mean, what sense does that make? I was kind of hot, and, and the commissioner. You know why it is. Commissioner Freeman joined in on that from Douglas County too. Not happy with it. Not happy with it because, and you know why it is because there are special interests who are pulling money from those right. URAs, and it starts up in Multnomah County. Is pulling what about a hundred million now out of the I don't, schools? I don't. Know. I mean, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, those huh. those businesses, uh, those investors and developers uh, developing those properties, if it's not viable on the face of it, then it shouldn't be developed and, and those resources should go to housing, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thompson? Phil Thompson, who's late? Morning, Good morning, Phil. Hey, Phil. Uh, did uh, on this? Did they drop the GP uh, mill side as also a offload for you know that? Uh, well, getting to what Rob says, these enterprise zones, uh, I've never agreed with it. If you invest your money, you accept the return on it. When you give it to these big corporations and everybody, they pocket the money. We pay the right. fees and the urban renewal. That we got right now at the port, if I remember right, it lasted for uh, 20, 30 some, doesn't it, John? Pardon me? 
The urban renewal zone for the port, it, it lasts is clear up into 2030, doesn't it? I can't remember. It's way up by one. It hasn't been long ago that was approved by the county here. <coughs> uh, but I'm not going to get into that. What I was going to say, of all the things they ever come up with here at the port uh, to put in, I think this is the most feasible one that they ever, they ever come up to, to be honest. Jordan Cole was doing the day that the citizens gave the commissioners, I think a thousand signatures with Bob. And, I don't remember. And uh, they wouldn't even allow the people to vote on it. So that set the stage. It took a few years, but Jordan Gold isn't here. So anyway, whatever we do on this, I think the public should have a lot of say on. But yeah. I'm for it myself. So. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? All right, then. And we call for the vote. All favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Chief. I uh, need a motion for consent calendar. Move to accept the consent calendar. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Chief. So apparently we have some late agenda items. Um, one said you're late, late, since they weren't listed. Well, yeah, I guess so. They're not labeled that way, but that's okay. So the first one we have is approving resolution 2303069L, authorizing the county council to sign agreements to participate in proposed settlement of the ongoing national opioid litigation. Did we have a motion to? I knew we did that earlier. That back covers when, all of them? Back when, yes. Back when Mike Rowley would add one late, late. I guess we covered them all right then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So after years of litigation, there are five additional companies. And those companies are Kiva Allergen, CVS, Walmart, and Walgreens that have reached a proposed settlement in the ongoing national opioid litigation. If folks will recall, we had a settlement that was approved. Uh, in late in 2021, early 2022, with three of the major distributors. Um, so this is an additional settlement, and, the, and, there, and there could be more coming down the line as well. Uh, in accordance with the previous agreement between Oregon counties and the state of Oregon, 45% of the settlement funds would go to the state for their use in opioid abatement, and 55% would go directly to the counties and cities. Uh, we worked quite a while to increase the percentage going to the counties and cities. Um, and we did pretty well compared with a lot of different states and their allocation. Uh, the percentage of direct allocation to local governments is in excess of the national default model. Um, I will note that some details of the final agreement between the counties and the state for splitting up the money are still under discussion between the county council group and um, the state of Oregon, and there's just a few details that we're still trying to work out. So I don't have the final agreement yet, but I, I, I'd, I'd like approval to sign it when, once we finalize, because the deadline is April 18th for participation in the settlement agreement. And our attorney that represents us in that uh, national litigation is um, recommending that we sign on to this settlement. Okay, so I have a motion. Move to approve resolution 2303069L, authorizing county council to execute agreements for Coos County to participate in the proposed settlement in the ongoing national opioid litigation upon resolution of discussions with the state of Oregon. No, sir. Second. Okay, discussion. Board? No. Keeper of the coin has something to the say. The keeper of the coin, otherwise known as Megan. Do we know if the fund's uses are going to be the same? In other words, can I put them in the same fund or do I have to set up a new fund? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I'll, I'll, I, I believe it's going to be the same. And so it'll be the same fund, but I'll let you know if it's different. But I don't think the terms of the, uh, the restrictions on the use remain different. Okay, thank you. And so the uses of the funds are? Uh, there's a huge document that talks about what you can spend on it, but it can be boiled down to opioid abatement, whether that's treatment or buying uh, Narcan or any of those sorts of things. It has to be very specifically uh, used to alleviate the opioid epidemic. 
Okay. Nothing for the general fund. No. 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 Okay. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Anybody in the audience want to comment about this? It's the National Opioid Settlement. Hearing none. Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All righty. Next one. County Representative Quebec, SCBEC Board. Apparently, John Sweet has resigned due to an increasingly tight schedule, so the board needs to appoint a replacement. Um, would you like to volunteer? How often is this meeting? It's about a quarterly meeting, and it normally happens on a Monday uh, morning late and runs through lunch. This, for me, it was more the timing of the meeting than the time it took. I wonder, I wonder if I would encounter a conflict of interest since um, I'm on the CCAT board and CCAT retains Quebec for management services. Can you do other things, so if that were a conflict, you could excuse yourself. So this is appointing a representative to the Quebec board, <clears throat> and, and you're on the CCAT board, and you... CCAT retains Quebec mm -hmm. for internal management. The general manager is actually contracted from Quebec. Okay. Sort of seems like it could be a conflict. Yeah, I, I, I think it's technically not because the CCAT board is, you know, a public organization and you're not going to personally benefit uh, from your role with that organization. True. So I, I, it, it could be an apparent conflict of interest, which I think it's up to you if you want to recuse yourself, but I don't think that you would be required to. It could be a, a perceived as one, but I think if looking at the statute, it wouldn't cover this situation because that's a public board upon which you serve and you're not going to personally benefit from mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Thank you. So I need a motion to I appoint. Move that we appoint Commissioner Taylor as the county's representative uh, to this Quebec board. Nice second. Any discussion? Anybody? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. You're it. Uh, County Representative on Workforce Investment Board. Uh, discuss finding a replacement County Representative and SOWEB Board of Directors because it was vacated by Commissioner Cribbins, who used to be on that board. I received a telephone call or an email from Kyle Stevens. Southwestern Oregon Workforce Investment Board Executive Director. Uh, he informed me that the uh, uh, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that the Southwestern Oregon Workforce Investment Board operates under require a county commissioner from each of the three counties, Goose, Curry, and Douglas, that are covered in their area of service. Uh, Melissa Cribbins had filled this role for us previously, and uh, they were reminded, uh, Kyle was reminded, they needed to react to reach out to the county to identify a replacement. The time commitment is minimal, has been for the past few years at least. Uh, they met once a year for 30 minutes or less to approve their budget, and a few more times during the year to appoint board members and the meetings took place at 7.30 a.m. in the mornings in Cusco. Hmm. So they're actually, what they're asking is that we replace the county representative on the SOWEB board of directors. You want to do it? Well, I can, I can do this. It doesn't conflict me with me time-wise. Okay. Are, are you up that early? <laughs> <laughs> He's usually here at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I would nominate John Sweet for the SOWIT board. I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion? Since we ran one of you. Yeah, thank you. How come you got that spot for me? I'm the Your chair, so I get to do it back and forth. Yeah. I get to look at each one of you and go, you're going to do it. <laughs> All right. Any discussion by the audience? Seeing none, all in favor of John Sweet being on the soil board, say aye. 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 You're it. Oh, okay. 
Thank All right, so um, commission reports. Agreed. Who wants to go first? I guess I can. Uh, we uh, purchased a new E4 server for the SO, Sheriff's Office, and because the other one was aged and wouldn't handle the, the needs for the Sheriff's Office, they went and viewed Eagle View, which was really interesting. It was a aerial system, Original, they fly over at different heights and uh, take pictures of all the property in the county. It was it has all kinds of uses, um, especially for the assessor's office, uh, planning office, etc. Except that it was a six-year contract of six hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars, and I went, sucked my breath in, and went, oh my gosh, when we're faced with a a huge budget shortfall in two years, so um, that wasn't so good. Um, went and met with some folks on Operation Rebuild Hope, and they're trying to reorganize and get back on track. And um, it, they have some really good ideas, some good people on the board now, and hopefully they'll be able to get out from under some of the issues they've been having. I went with Gary, as I said, out to Oaks Pavilion. And I think we all participated in the, the County of Forest Trust Land Committee meeting when it was last Friday at 9 o'clock, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? Well, that's it for me. Anybody? Right. Um, yeah, the uh, County Forest Trust Lands Committee meeting, we did all participate. Um, you know, we, there was an extensive discussion about how to handle the, the state's really, I, I mean, trust is the wrong word. It's a, it's a misnomer here because the state really can't be trusted. And so how do we as counties get the state to conduct themselves in, in the management of these trust lands in a way that actually yields some fiscal benefit to the counties? And, you know, no answers were forthcoming in this meeting. And it seemed to me that there was a, there was a lack of fortitude, uh, a, lack of, uh, a lack of creative approach to solving this problem. I do have some ideas that I'm not going to actually discuss at this time, but, um, but I think that in the interest of the people of Coos County, uh, we as commissioners are going to need to be prepared to take a, a, a courageous stand to force the state into a position to uh, yield back to us the benefit that we're supposed to be getting from those lands, especially in the face of continued, relentless, unfunded mandates that are handed down from the state. It's not fair to the people of Coos County and you know, we're, we're going to have to all stand together against this kind of injustice. Um, Commissioner Sweet and I, a couple weeks ago, went to the uh, went out to the Oaks building as previously discussed. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing those repairs uh, get proposed, bid, and executed uh, in preparation for the fair. And uh, last item I want to mention is just that I've been working on a uh, a community issue up in Allegheny where there's an access road that's under dispute and uh, hoping to come to resolution on that uh, this week and restore the, the uh, uh, restore the cohesiveness of a community and hopefully provide protected access to the cemetery up there. It's uh, been a, a great privilege to be able to be involved in that. And I think that's all I have. Yeah. Uh, we're in the middle of budget season, but not always a you know, real fun season. We talked about the county's financial condition <clears throat> in uh, the last few meetings. Um, we're, we're confronted with uh, a significant deficit, uh, a deficit of over $2 million that we're trying to figure out how to, to balance. Uh, our departments uh, are, have been very frugal, uh, lived within 
reasonable expectations of, of funding. Uh, they still have to function. That takes people. That takes supplies. And with the job market as it is and inflation as it is, uh, uh, it's a challenge to, to operate within the constraints that we have. Uh, we are fortunate to have some reserves uh, only because we have available to us uh, some money from the American Rescue Plan, one of the COVID-sponsored uh, uh, enterprise of, of pieces of legislation that gave a lot of money to local governments. And we've not spent that uh, holding it for an occasion like this. Uh, so we, we, I think you get through this year, uh, the bad part is that once that American Rescue Plan money is gone, uh, which we estimate will happen uh, if something other, I don't know what else would happen, but it will, we have enough to balance our budget this year and perhaps next. And after that, uh, it gets more difficult. So, we're kind of operating on borrowed time in a way, uh, or some answers, but uh, they, they they all cost money. And at some point in time, I, I think we have to be responsible within the county for, for generating that money ourselves. So we're not quite there, but we are operating on borrowed time. You want something fun? Yeah. <laughs> that we haven't been real. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I I, did, I just want to make sure that I've been trying to. I, I really welcome the opportunity to have you all here uh, to share with you the financial situation of the county. We're not in a particularly strong position. I think we've done a remarkably good job of minimizing. Our, our taxes, uh, at least the taxes that go to run the county. Uh, but at some point in time, we either have to have more money or fewer county services. I thought it was supposed to be a happy note. Now I can, I had to complete my sentence. <laughs> no, that wasn't fun at all. Yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> With it. Ben, we haven't seen you for ages. I was wondering about the six hundred thousand, and who's 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 getting that, Frank Williams, and who's getting that? Who's spending so that? Where's it going to go? And no. I was a curious, very curious about the uh, if you folks are going to get some of this timber ground back that they don't that we give away, like some of the other counties said that. I believe it was the Capitol Press. I read it over some of the other counties was going to go back and try to get the ground back, the forest back that yeah. we had given away. That's they were the, holding the top contract. There was a bill before the legislature, legislature uh, for Coos County to get those lands back. And it, it died. It, don't, it, it died in committee. Yep. And the same lands throughout Western Oregon, the 700,000 plus acres that the counties turned over to ODF back in the 40s, the early, late 30s. That's what Rod was talking about because the, the Oregon Department of Forestry Committee has decided they're going to have 55% of all those lands locked up for the next 70 years. Hmm. So these are the same lands that, that Coos County and other counties involved with these county forest trust lands uh, sued the Oregon Department of Forestry and the state of Oregon for recovery of damages, both past and future. And the total amount of the suit was about a billion, one hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. The counties were, the counties prevailed at uh, the circuit court uh, in Lynn County, at which the case was heard. But 
the award was thrown out by the Oregon Court of Appeals. Is that not correct? Correct, and not heard by, by and the Supreme Court. And the Oregon. Supreme Court has denied right. hearing it. And before, before I sat in this chair, the first I ever heard of this case, I was absolutely opposed to that monetary settlement and took the position that what should happen is those lands should be given back to the counties. Right. I maintain that position, and so we will we'll continue that fight. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Thank you. All right, Keith. <clears throat> and um, from yesterday's budget discussion of different departments, one person in this audience will be pleased to know, <coughs> sitting in the audience, that the tax department is going to change vendors for the tax bills if you have the exact same name and the exact same address <coughs> on your properties, you will get it all in one package. <laughs> I wonder Activism who that was matters. that was jumping up and down in the back. <laughs> okay, Commissioner uh, Public Comments, there's only one, <coughs> Phil Thompson? It <coughs> signed up anyway. Others will be. Yep. Bill Thompson, Foods Bay. Uh, Lance has decided he'll straighten me out and save you guys the trouble. Is that an impossibility or no, just an decide, attempt? I don't know. Yeah, I think I can take it. <laughs> uh, but one thing I'd like to ask that when we signed up for the comment today, you had. Two sheets, or you had one on a, a, a public hearing and then on citizens' comment. They was in a row there. Now, public comments, uh, or whatever you want, uh, is that, that's exactly what he did. Yeah. But uh, a public hearing, you don't have a, a three minute rule or nothing on a public hearing, do you? Yeah. No. Well, that's what I'm saying. It was pretty confusion. Okay. The way you had it laid out there, All right, and so forth. But other than that, yeah, the lamps take care of it. Okay, Matt. Let's comment on that while Matt's coming up. That that the white form is just a record that you were here. That's nothing yeah. more than that. Uh, right. If and it's optional, you don't just have to sign it. it. <laughs> and the colored sheet is if you want to speak. Yeah, it's this one here. But the white one is just normally a sign-up sheet that you were here. Case we need to get a hold of you, and we didn't know who you were. Morning, Matt. Hey, morning, Matt Will Lang, excuse me. Um, so, yeah, I obviously didn't put my name on the sheet. I was so used to not having public comment, I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, th uh, thank you to you all for bringing this back. I totally screwed my You got up, used to so. that pretty fast. It didn't yeah, last I that did. long. It's a little disturbing. No me, excuses it's anymore. Very trainable. It's <laughs> <laughs> bright orange, yeah. So. Um, so the thing I'm wanting to talk about actually would not have been brought up if you guys didn't bring the public comment back because it's not a, something that was on the agenda. Good. Um, so what I want to talk about is regarding uh, Coos County Clerk Julie Brecky. And you will recall this because this occurred at the Lakeside Town Hall. Um, just in preface, I would, if possible, I know the town halls are a little trying to be a little informal. Um, maybe possibly have someone recording them, maybe just even audio. Um, might be helpful given this situation. So at the meeting, there was a point where Commissioner Taylor was speaking for a minute or two, and he made a couple comments, I believe, about election irregularities. I don't recall exactly what the comments were. Um, so the meeting goes on. Uh, we reach the end of the meeting. We're about to dismiss, and County Clerk Brecky stands up, raises her hand, and says, oh, there's something I would like to talk about. So no problem, she gets up there, and it was quite obvious that what she wanted to talk about was in negative to re negative response to what Commissioner Taylor had talked about. Um, she made comment about, oh, independent groups have verified the 2020 election was the safest in history, et cetera, et cetera. At one point, she said something that was incredibly disturbing to me because it's completely inaccurate. Um, I'm quoting her as closely as I could possibly remember. She said, ballot harvesting is not legal in Oregon. She repeated it several times. Mm -hmm. That is completely untrue. Uh, in my mind, there are only two reasons why she would say that. Either she was lying, which I'm not gonna make an assumption of, 
or she's ignorant of the law. Uh, the fact that a county clerk could be ignorant of the ballot harvesting law in Oregon is a little disturbing to me. So I want to read you a couple things. This is a definition from Wikipedia. Ballot collecting, also known as ballot harvesting, is the gathering and submitting of completed absentee or mail-in voter ballots by third-party individuals, volunteers, or workers, rather than submission by voters themselves directly to ballot collection sites. That definition is supported by articles from the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and I believe the newspaper in San Diego. So it's a pretty broad, broadly accepted definition of ballot collecting or harvesting. From there, I want to go to Oregon state law, just to clarify for everyone so they know the truth on this matter. This is from ballotpedia.org. Um, they're basically a website, one of the major websites that summarizes, summarizes election law across the United States. It says, Oregon law permits a person to return mail ballots on behalf of voters. It says that a person who is not an election official cannot collect ballots within a certain distance of an election office and must display a sign at such collection site, noting that it is not an official drop site. So there's two stipulations within so many feet of an election office, and you have to put a sign up saying, not an official drop site. Quote from Oregon law, from the ORS, the elector may return the marked ballot to the county clerk by United States mail or by depositing the ballot at at the office of the county clerk at any place of deposit designated by the county clerk or at any location described in ORS, etc., etc. The ballot must be returned in a return identification envelope. If the elector returns the ballot by mail, the elector must provide the postage. Subject to paragraph E of this subsection, if a, if a person returns a ballot for an elector, so this is someone else returning the ballot, the person shall deposit the ballot in a manner described in paragraph B of this subsection, not later than two days after receiving the ballot. And it goes on for some other things. So you can harvest ballots as long as it's with the permission of the person named on the ballot. You can only do it with its, with outside so many feet from an election office. If you're going to put up a booth that has to have a sign on it saying it's not an official election site. But this happens all throughout Oregon. I returned about eight ballots of my friends. It's completely legal. It would also be legal to go door to door, be like, ma'am, sir, can I return your ballot for you? You're allowed to do this. So it's a little disturbing to me that the county clerk, in trying to correct, correct what she views as election misinformation, is actually spreading her own election misinformation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Matt. I'll, as a point of clarification, that uh, I made that statement in response to a direct question that I was asked whether ballot harvesting was legal in Oregon, and I stated that it was, and the rest of what you said was was absolutely accurate. Thank you. Mr. Taylor? Uh, yeah, just start printing the comment sheet and just print my name on it, and you'll be fine. It's <laughs> can't resist. Um, I want to make sure the lady from U.S. Fish and Wildlife says, I don't need that personally when I put the comments I said. I hope she don't take it personally because I know that uh, uh, just because I see U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as the devil, I don't think she's an evil person. I, she seems very nice, so I just want to make that yeah. clear. Um, you know me, i am come up, I'm straightforward, pretty curt about things. And uh, I do have a couple of questions uh, about issues that I haven't seen on any of the work sessions or in any, and I've been here for the last couple of commissioners meeting. Did we give the contract to South are to uh, Coos Drop, the youth group, and I think they received about $230,000 a year. And two, have we closed forest lands, Coos County forest lands, to the public? Number one, Coos Drop. <clears throat> I resisted Coos Health and Wellness providing money for Coos Drop because I felt uncomfortable with Coos Drop, my personal feeling. Yeah. As it turned out before we had the next meeting to discuss that, uh, Advanced Health and apparently uh, whoever was involved decided not to fund that grant through Goose Health and Wellness anymore. And as far as I know, Advanced Health is funding Goose Drop at the same amount of $230,000. 
So it's out of the county's hands. Out of the county's but hands. It's an odd, it's odd relationship because Advanced Health gets, as I understand it, gets their money from state and federal funds. They are a private corporation, and then they disperse those funds to Coos Health and Wellness to other medical facilities and other uh, things that are helping in the community. So I'm kind of puzzled at why a private corporation would be doing that in the first place. That's a damn good question. Hmm. Makes you I understand they're private. I, yeah. I haven't exactly looked at, but I'm trying to find who was on the board of directors so I could call them. There's no listing on their there website. There's no listing, isn't that? You know that too, apparently. Yeah. yeah. And the forest lands? So the forest lands is, uh, is an ongoing problem. As uh, some of you in the room will be aware, one of the issues that I campaigned on for this office was keeping those public forest land roads open yes. for access. Um, when I campaigned on that issue, there were, there were realities on the ground that I was unaware of and that appear possibly to have even been worsening in recent months. And those issues have to do with deposit of illegal garbage. I'm talking dumping of fiberglass boats full of household garbage. Um, uh, slaughtered animal remains, I mean domestic animals. Um, we have, uh, a week and a half ago, we discovered, the well, Lan one of Lance's guys discovered somebody had gone in and cut down over 10 trees up to 30 inches in diameter for to steal firewood. And, and the cut trees issue has been happening all over the place. Um, we have uh, we have vandalism of shooting of, of signs at the, at the bike trails. Um, I mean, over and over every week we get reports of this kind of stuff going on. And so, you know, the, as much as I support and we all support the, the right of the people to access those lands yeah. that we all own, we also have a responsibility to our constituents, to all the citizens of the county, to, to protect those assets. And so it's, it's a real quandary. And um, I, I personally have been, I've conducted some research on uh, gate mechanisms, um, remote uh, access systems that could be uh, distributed to people with, for a small fee to use an access card. So there's a record of who's going in and out of those gates, um, I haven't found a suitable technological solution to the problem. And uh, in fact, you and I discussed that yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, earlier on, Rob. And so, you know, we don't know what the solution is, but for the time being, it does appear that the most, uh, the most prudent thing to do is, is to gate those roads off. I mean, I, I, I have, I'm at a complete loss and, and frankly, I'm heartbroken about it because I thought that, that the people of Coos County as, as, a, as a whole, we would all regard these lands responsibly, but it's not so, you know, we've got people who are just ruining it for everybody. And it really, it, it, it hurts me because, um, you know, I campaigned on this and, and, you know, unfortunately, you, you don't know everything when you're campaigning. And, and I, you know, I wish I had a better answer right now, but I don't. So if anybody has a, a technological solution to provide controlled gate access with video recording, please hit me up because that's what I'm looking for. Was it voted on by the board or is this a unilateral decision by one of the commissioners? There's been no decision. <laughs> no, decision. no decision. It's mostly the county board. It's conversation. Yeah, but mm -hmm. you would if if you do close the land, is that something you have to bring forward for a vote at a commissioner's meeting? We, we, we need to have a work yeah. session or something. I, I appreciate it. But normally we we have meetings um, later on this year when we get to fire season, then we shut things down. You you have to shut it down. Anyway. Yeah. that I can completely and, understand. And you really know, and uh, maybe some others don't that I was talking about the six million we get in property tax that costs seven million to run the jail. What about all the other general fund departments? 
Well, the county for us is what supports primarily right. all those other departments. And if we lose the county forest, we've lost monies for all those general fund departments. And and one more point. Yeah. The, the, the roads are absolutely open for foot traffic and you can get a bicycle in there. Right. No problem. Right. But, Some of them though, like the mining area where I go shooting right up above Bologna's Ranch, you know, just south of Bologna's Ranch. Mm -hmm. I go shooting up there and We've actually have pooled garbage out there, mm -hmm. and we had an yeah. agreement with the guy who went and collected trash. You have the youth kids there picking up trash. We told them we would pull the garbage in, we'd set it aside, and you know, you guys know Jim Bice. He would call mm -hmm. them and get that stuff picked up. Mm -hmm. We need a work session on this before any decision is made. <clears throat> I would definitely agree with that, yeah. and I would heavily advertise it. And because I, I agree with you, people need to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to use those lands, I'm one who's more than happy to participate in something that helps either watch them or clean them up. One mm -hmm. of those two things, and I think we could do both. And yeah, I think there may be technolo technological things we could do as much as putting cameras at the, because many of these places only have one entrance to get right. in and out of. So maybe we could put up a camera. <laughs> the problem is, is I know the expenses. No, yes. Not just the expense, it's not the big deal. It's the vandalism. It's they go and steal them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm this happens at night. Live sign. Well, even even at night, they have infrared cameras. Yeah, they go and cut them off the trees. And that and, was one. Of and the take them home with them. You know, I had, we had discussed that uh, in another meeting, a uh, private meeting. We had discussed this coming up, and that was what they had said that uh, a lot of times the cameras just disappear. Yep. And so, yeah, I you know, and, and like I told you, maybe, and I'm joking about the one dead or alive, but maybe a reward system for people yep. who catch these people and finding a way to admonish these people who are doing this. This is just absolutely horrible. And if anyone needs wood, I'm sure there are places that we can get wood mm -hmm. for people right. who need it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's plenty of, we got a permit from the county forestry. Yeah. There's plenty the of slash to yeah. be harvested from, yeah. and that would be an actual enhancement. But you know, on this issue, I'm, I'm always, uh, brought back around. Well, first I'll say that, that it is whatever the ultimate solution suite is, it's going to be a suite. It, it's not going to be just one thing. It's going to be a whole bunch and accountability um, uh, is a part of it. But it always comes back to me for to this uh, to this radio ad that former Commissioner Gordon Ross used to run. And he said, you know, this is this is years ago. The number is way different today. Coos County can save over $10 million a year if only everybody would live by the teachings of Jesus. And that is truth. You know, you know? he used to have another expression as, a, as a, a dairy farmer. He used to say that he milked the cows in the morning and milked the taxpayers in the evening. So, you know, uh, can't support you know, that one. You know, was a good one for that. But, uh, Bob, I want to thank you for bringing back these public comments. I want to thank you for being lax on the time that you've been giving. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank yeah. you for putting them at the end of the meeting. Sure. I personally think strategically it's so much better to have this at the end of the meeting so we can discuss all the things that we have been through because at the beginning of the meeting there have been times up here i made comments that were irrelevant because going back through the meeting it, mm -hmm. you find out the situation has changed so yeah. i like this much much better well, a lot of times yes. well it's changed it too that each individual item can be commented on but then as you're sitting there and thinking about something that was on the agenda right and then later on you go hey what hey. about yeah. yeah yeah it's a better deal uh, yes, yes. I'm going to make it clear. I'm starving. <laughs> Hello, so Diane. I'm Diane. And um, I love IT, poor work in IT, but sometimes you have to change it and you have to go with people. I was a consultant to Essex Construction in Lane County. Mm -hmm. They have problems like what you have with the forest areas, but they have them with their construction sites. So they used people. They had homeless people who were in there. RV, and they put a uh, porta potty there, and they paid them huh. to watch their areas. And that's what you need to do with that road. You have a whole bunch of people living in motorhomes that haven't got any place to go. It's a great idea. Put them in. That's what we did with Essex, and it made it so that we solved the county's problem 
of moving them or having them have them over state. And they have a small amount of money, which what you're paying for right now for your garden tree. Thank you. Good Mr. Thompson? You get a second shot at this? Uh, uh, this is number sure. three. Uh, well, uh, well public comment is number three. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, but to divorce what she said, but I actually used to live on Guy Wheel right there at the Humane Society where the dog plant is now. That road came out there. He lived there for years uh -huh. and he had opened the gate for us to go in and out. And out. But, well, I just want to say, every time you change something, you put the problem somewhere else. You can ask that fellow to work in the wall. I don't know his name. I saw him and three or four people down there with trucks loading up the garbage that they take up in the forest now. They're dumping there on the Red Dock Road or down towards where Lance Morgan used to live. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you go from maybe to Charleston, you'll see everything. So you're just, you're moving it somewhere as else. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a real good solution just to lock the gates. I've been around here a long time. I, I don't see, I know I was hunting here in 64, 62, 64, and the county forest roads were all open. I don't see if there's more garbage now than there was then, to be honest with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Anybody so. else in the, here in the yeah. audience? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Okay, that was a long day, not a long meeting, but I'm Rayleigh Cousins. I live in Coos County. Uh -huh. um, Saunders Lake area. I was just going to say, I thank you for the outreach meeting that you had in Lakeside. And I look forward to the other. I think that's a great idea. Um, I believe that I was there as well. And Julie Brecky was simply respond responding to um, the charge that it was a false election, which you all won at. One of the chargers who had said it was a false election uh, did win. And that is because we have a very um, reliable and well-run elections in this county by mail. And so all of the information can be found at the Coos County website. And there's a whole ton of information at that site. So I encourage you to support um, Coos County elections. And I thank you for all that you do. Much appreciated. Okay. So along that line, April 13th at 6 o'clock, we had Front Street Food Provisioning oh, is going to be the next one. Okay, and the 13th also in Lakeside was account was announced at that meeting that I went to where they're going to have a homeless um, yeah. someone from the homeless state yeah. to talk. And I'm, I'm going to be going to League I'm going of, to Lakeside. I think it's the League of Oregon Cities attorney. Is that what it is? I don't yeah. know, but that was announced there. That's where I heard mm -hmm. about it. So, but the next one for the county outreach is the 13th at the um, provisioners. Yes. Okay, that's good. Six I think those are wonderful things. All right. Yeah, I appreciate it. And for the record, I would like to say that that uh, I do not question the integrity of County Clerk Julie Brecky. Um, what my question and issue is, is with the Dominion software run vote counting machines. And that's a statewide issue. And so if we're going to research information that is on the Oregon Secretary of State site or on our own county website regarding election integrity. Um, I would encourage also an equal time invested into uh, the, the uh, facts presented by Dr. Douglas Frank, by uh, uh, Captain Seth Keschel regarding the integrity or lack thereof of those, those uh, vote counting machines and uh, uh, the software that controls them as well as their internet connectivity. Uh, it's, been, it's been widely stated and claimed that those machines do not have any internet connectivity and that is patently, provably false. So, uh, you know, there are issues in the elections and I hope that all of us want nothing other than absolute transparency, honesty, and integrity in our elections. That's certainly, uh, if, that's, if, if that's not our common interest, it certainly should be. Okay. Thank I'm you. Really, just one more quick thing to say. I've been in, a, a, in the election observer for many years. I lived here mm -hmm. for 50 years. And um, our elections are separated completely from the state. 
if you understand how the system works, we report our outcomes to the state. We are not connected to the state. That's how it works. So and if sense. you and if you understand that uh, that in 2020 there was a an 8.5 fold increase in the number of adjudicated ballots uh, that those machines then uh, kicked to an alternative outcome, then you understand that that is something that requires some investigation. And the investigation into that issue has been stymied at every turn. So, um, you know, again, the integrity and transparency is what really is key. And again, I also say that there is no question in my mind, I do not call into question the integrity of our county clerk. Well, that's good because our system, we're talking local here. And what we're talking local is it is all very clear and in place. And if you go to the town and I'm sure that you will see how it works. So we're talking local. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, anybody else in the audience here? Anybody online? I f keep forgetting people online. Anybody online want to come in? Anybody online? They all see other than Owen, all seem to be muted, whoever Owen is. There's one. Bob? Yes, I'd like to talk if I could, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you, can you get closer to the mic or something? It's... I'm closer to the mic. Did that help? Okay, that's better. Yes. <laughs> okay, this is County Clerk Julie Brecky, and I would like to just point out that the term that's used is ballot harvesting, and nowhere in the laws does it mention ballot harvesting. And what I said was I encourage citizens to do their own research in this area. In Oregon, ballot collection is illegal, and there are different um, categories of what ballot collection means. So that's why I encourage people to do the research because it depends on what state you're on, what state you live in, um, to determine um, what is is allowed for ballot collecting. Ballot harvesting has been a term that I stay away from because it's used to imply that something nefarious is taking place, just like organ harvesting. Ballot collection is not a nefarious thing. And if you're not okay with the process of ballot collection, that is not a city or countywide issue. That's something that you need to look at on a state level and do your own research. In Oregon, you are allowed to give your ballot to a person that you specify takes your ballot to the ballot box. That would be like if you are married and you want to take your spouses to the ballot box and they say, yes, you are the person that I allow to take it to the ballot box, then you can take it. The reason for this is because of things like that, husband, wife taking it, or maybe you have an elderly person that wants to vote and they need you to take it to the ballot box for them. If you're not comfortable with someone else taking your ballot, you do not need to specify someone else to do it. Take it yourself. But as far as the term ballot harvesting goes, it's not anywhere written in the law. It's called ballot collection. And that's why I encourage everyone to do their own research so that they can feel comfortable with their process. As far as um, the comments that... Um, Commissioner Taylor made, I appreciate your uh, support on our election integrity locally. And I, again, would encourage to say that anyone can make allegations around um, elections as far as our um, machines go, but they do have to go through quite a bit of process. One, they have to pass a process at the state level, the federal level. They also have to, we test our ballots each time we do an election before we run through um, actual ballots, we do test ballots. The um, members of the community are invited to observe that if they would like to see it. We post the dates of those on our webpage. And we encourage people to be a part of the process so they can see how elections are run. 
I believe that you will find that our elections are run very securely. If you have questions about any of that, I encourage you to call my office or again, sign up to be an observer or come in and observe the process when it's open to the public. Okay, anybody else? With that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.